Welcome back to the Law and Crime Network. I am Linda Kenny Bodden for the Law and Crime Network, and we have a number of things happening. Well, this is the cell phone analyst of Stephen Jones's cell phone, and he's really going through, uh, I call it mundane, because it's the background testimony of how these analysts work to extract a cell phone. So while uh, he's talking a little bit, I'd like to bring on my guest. The first time I've had him on as a guest with me, this is professor, also lawyer, obviously, at the University of Memphis Law School, uh, Stephen Mulroy. Stephen, uh, come, come on on. Hey, thank you. Yeah, and, and I also like to mention that he is the author. In case you don't want to listen to crime today, or after you finish listening to crime, because I'd like you really to stay with us, of a book called Rethinking U.S. Election Law, Unskewing the System. Now, Stephen, just real quick, how do you unskew the system? Give me like a 10-second answer. <laughs> okay. Uh, you have the states join the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact, so we don't have to worry about the Electoral College. And we get rid of gerrymandering by uh, moving towards a system of proportional representation, where 30% of the votes gets 30% of the seats, and 55% of the votes gets 55% of the seats. Okay, and so you see, you see why he's a law professor, because he can break it down quickly, succinctly. So let's talk a little bit about this case. I was going to say, if you need more information, you can read the book, then we're done. <laughs> okay, so it, let's talk a little bit about this case, Stephen. Uh, this man is charged with five counts of murdering his children, one through what, children one through eight. Yesterday in the courtroom, there was a really emotional testimony from the children's biological mother, uh, she broke down. She was wailing. I mean, anyone who's got any kind of a heart just, uh, you, know, you know, I mean, I'm, I was still like reeling from it. I mean, then I watched it again this morning and I went again into like my pain, which obviously the jury has their pain. So you're the defense attorney. How do you prevent a jury from becoming emotional when they're considering a death penalty case with that kind of trauma that was evidenced in this courtroom? Well, it's very hard to prevent uh, that kind of effect on the jury. I mean, the jury are human beings, after all, and emotional appeals are going to work to them, work for them. There are only two ways to do it. One is to try to establish that the defendant sympathizes with the uh, mother's pain, but was not the one responsible, or the defendant sympathizes with the mother's pain, but was insane. And, and, that's, and that's really what they're trying to do here. They have an insanity defense. Now, we've seen three insanity defenses, Stephen, uh, in the last uh, month that we've been covering here at Law and Crime. We have the John Chuck trial in Florida who killed his, his uh, young daughter. We have the Borgoyne case in uh, Vermont that the jury right now is deliberating. Verdict watch, everybody. Okay, and they've imposed an insanity defense. And we have this case. Is it because there's more uh, mental disease and untreated mental illness that's around? Is it because more people, the doctors are seeing more people that are insane under the medical definition? Or is there something else going on here? I honestly don't know what explains it. I mean, it might be a statistical fluke, but it might be a blip. You know, it doesn't necessarily portend a long-term trend. One of the reasons why, uh, you know, it might just be that we've had a run of cases where the defense really had no other choice but to plead the insanity defense because there was no way to uh, eliminate reasonable, you know, create reasonable doubt as to the person's actual guilt in terms of having done the crime. But you know, one of the reasons I wonder if there really is going to be an upswing is that the insanity defense is rarely successful. Uh, it's pled in less than 1% of cases, and even within the universe of cases where it's pled, uh, less than 25% of the time yeah. it's successful. Yeah, no, no, you're absolutely right. So let's listen to a little bit more of the courtroom testimony right now to see whether we can start using our lens, which is the one of courtroom watcher, to see if we believe Stephen Jones is insane. Well, that is the prosecution laying out one of the uh, elements in a crime. And he's talking about one of the victims, two of the victims. There's actually five victims. Gene Rossi joins me from Virginia. Gene. Hello. You're my buddy. You're, You're my buddy. You need I, no I introduction you. here. So, G, I'm listening to that, and, and I'm trying to put on my clinical lawyer face. And then yep. this morning we had testimony, which we're going to get to later on, uh, with one of the victims starting out. But in this case, we have yep. the defense is going to probably say, uh, I probably, you know, I just have it on a little, you know, birdie, uh, that either he didn't do it or it was a case of mistaken identity. So if you have five victims, doesn't that help yep. the prosecution? Yeah. Oh, boy. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> Candy sir, right, Gene? Hey, look, let me tell you this. When I was a prosecutor, if I had two victims, I would be happy. Five 
Uh, that's icing on the cake. I will say this, and I talked to the great Bob Bianchi about this yesterday. Not that you're not great. You are great. But but um, three, uh, three I think, are good. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm really troubled a little bit based on the opening of the defense by Jane Doe 4 and Jane Doe 5. Okay, those are the um, last two cases they added on, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm troubled by Jane Doe 5. I think that's the jacuzzi incident. Right. Um, you know, my, my main thing is if um, for Jane Doe 5, if I'm the defense attorney, why did you get into jacuzzi if one or two weeks before he had exposed himself to you and done something allegedly vulgar? Well, Why well Gene, Gene, let, we're going to have to listen to that because maybe the defense in their opening statement will Me deal with that or suggest a certain course of action they're taking. Let's hear. Well, that was an interesting opening statement, wasn't it, my two guests, Stephen Mulroy and Gene Rossi? I've got you boxed. I understand you two know each other. But, Stephen, I'd like to start with you before Gene obviously comes in because he says he's in heaven. This is not a case about heaven. This is a case about rape, Correct. Correct. Absolutely. Yes. So, so, these are, these so are, when, when he goes with the defense attorney, and believe me, I know all these little tricks, goes and puts his hand on his client's shoulder and kind of like stays there and, and gives his credibility. There you go. No, the one hand, two hands to his client. Uh, we know as defense attorneys to do that because we want to show that the client is likable and we're not afraid of the client, right? Absolutely. The defense attorney wants to humanize uh, the client. You know, it's not the defendant. It's a real human being with a name and a life story and someone that the jury should empathize with. But, you know, after they hear all the evidence from all these many different victims who did not know each other, I don't know how much empathy the jury is going to have at the end of the day. Yeah. Gene Rossi, you know, when I first read what our, our producers, executive producer, Kathy Russon, sent to us, I said, whoop, sex offender here. That was my initial reaction. So I'm sure the jury, when they hear the opening of the prosecutor, as we just heard, and then the defense attorney, they'll say, sex offender here, initial reaction. But I'll be fair, right? Absolutely. But I got to do a shout out. In 2003, I think it was, Professor Mulroy, when you and I were <laughs> federal prosecutors, we had one of the greatest jury trials in history, United States versus Robert Conway. You were great. Oh, my God. Uh, well, well, our, our guests are in a love fest here, but sometimes the love fest can be a non-consensual one, and that's what Kellen Winslow is about. We have to take a quick break, and we'll be back on the other side with the more of victim number one. And it's not a little break. It, it may be, oh, I can't even discuss it with you. Come back. You'll have to listen. Okay, so that's the preliminary setup, and we'll go listen to more of her testimony in a little bit. But I'd like to bring my guest in if I can, because she's talking about, she's using pretty plain language uh, that Kellen Winslow, when he got into the car, he said he was going to F her. Now, we're lucky here at Law and Crime because we're not uh, uh, a CBS or an NBC yeah. that we have to bleep these. You really get to hear what the jury hears and how the witness is presented. Uh, Gene Rossi and Stephen Mulroy, my two guests. Uh, Stephen, let me just start with you. When a victim uses the specific language with, and appearing comfortable with the specific language, does that hurt the prosecution's case? Or is it just, hey, that's what this guy said? Well, I suppose you could argue that since she was so casual about it, that might have suggested that she was, you know, I don't know, not as emotionally affected by it or, you know, too experienced or whatever. But, I mean, at the end of the day, um, I think it reflects more negatively on the defendant if the jury credits the testimony for him to be so, you know, callous and uh, blatant about it. When, like I said before, if, if she and other people who do not know each other are all mutually reinforcing by talking about these uh, sexual assaults, uh, you know, at the end, I think that's going to take precedence. So, Gene Rossi, you know, when I was a prosecutor, bringing up uh, uh, Bob Bianchi, New Jersey-type stories, uh, I had prosecuted a man for rape, and in the process of rape, he had also some uh, peeping kind of Tom things where he'd expose himself in windows, and the question was, how do you identify him? And I went to my boss, who was the first assistant prosecutor at that point, and I said, I'd like to do a penis lineup, okay? Yep. You're, you're not laughing. Now, no. <laughs> because that's been an issue in some cases, hasn't it, where people couldn't identify somebody's private parts when they were accused of, of uh, having uh, been raped by them. Absolutely. When you have a jury in front of you and it's a, a case where you can have vulgarities and descriptions and private parts shown, you got to tell that jury, listen, this is a serious case and we're going to talk about serious personal things. And if you have to do a lineup with someone's Johnson, you got to go ahead and do a lineup with someone's Johnson or six pack. 
That's your job because it's rape. And you got to embrace the charges. You can't be embarrassed. Well, yeah, it is. It is interesting because you want to make the jury not embarrassed. I'm glad, Gene, that it's Gene Rossi, not Gene Johnson, that's uh, uh, commenting with me today. But let's go back into the court earlier this morning. It's not historical. This is victim number one telling us in pretty blunt terms what happened. Well, she's pretty blunt about what happened, Gene Rossi. Correct. Now, it seems to me that when you have somebody who's pretty blunt about what happened, that that would help her. What, what troubled me, if I'm the defense, and I'd pick up on is that she follows him over a five-foot fence. So when he says he's going to kill her, you know, and he, there's no indication of a gun, and then she follows him back over the five-foot fence to the car. That seems to me is the best place to indicate that it may have been consensual. If you're Here's defense. The, Linda, let me, let me I, I was thinking the same thing. Because we can't see her demeanor, uh, just the audio, we're, we're limited. I, I would love to see the reaction of the jury because I hate to say this, I don't, I don't see a lot of emotion and trauma from her words when she's describing this event. And it's, as you said, it's very blunt and almost, you know, matter of fact. And I'm wondering if the jury is feeling the same way. And if that's the way she describes it in front of a jury, a high profile trial, you know, was there some room to argue that maybe this was consensual? Maybe it was just an agreement to have rough sex. We don't know. Well, it sounds like Stephen Mulroy, if you're the defense, were you going to go with this if, if I would... I were doing the defense. And you have to be careful, though, because a woman has a right to say no, no matter what her state in life, no matter what her position, and she has a right to say no at any time. And that's pretty certain. But here you could possibly argue that maybe she was upset because she started bleeding, because he was a little rougher, because his penis was bigger than she thought it would be, uh, or that she didn't get paid, and that all these kind of like kind of go into that. Is that correct? Well, that's probably what the defense is going to feel like it has to do in order to create some reasonable doubt on the existence of consent, that it might have started out consensual and then things got rougher than she expected. And, you know, now she's uh, mad about it. Uh, you know, who knows what the jury will think? I think Gene Rossi has a good point about the sort of flat affect of the of the witness, you know, being a, a problem for the prosecution. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, like Jean says, we can't see her. So right. we don't right. know what her right. demeanor is. Right. And, and Jean, on that point, though, I mean, she may also have a hard background. She's walking on the street. Uh, she's hitchhiking. She does save her white leathery like pants and it comes back to his DNA. And she reports that, you know, she reports it early on, but they don't take the pants from from later. I mean, that also mitigates, though, in her favor. So how does a jury muddle your way through things that sound I, like there's consensual, but also sound like he raped it? And if you take the other four women, you're like, uh-oh. Yeah, what, what does hurt the defense is that she did report it. But but I, I wish I could see her demeanor. And uh, I, I, I'm not just trying to go back to Steve's this trial Steve and I had. We called a couple witnesses, uh, and, and there was a lot of emotion, and there was no violence involved. And this is a horrible allegedly horrible rape. And I just don't see that unbridled um, trauma that, that I would expect from a witness who was told, if you don't have sex with me, I'm going to kill you. Well, I don't you know, get Jean, that feel. We'll have, to, we'll have to see what the additional cross-examination is like. And, you know, I would point out that sometimes uh, women and victims take things differently and are able to deal with things differently and process them differently uh, as, as opposed to what you would normally expect. But with that, uh, we have to go to a break. When we come back, more on the Kellen Winslow trial, our NFL player in California.